So last night you were to have read This Fleeting World, pages 23 to 32. And before we get started, I just want to start off by saying, even though we're probably going to spend the better part of the year talking about countries that are familiar to us, uh, we have to realize that at this point we have no countries. And for quite some time we don't. In fact, we, the concept of the nation state is a 19th century construction. And the only reason why we'll refer to these places by the countries that we know them as is just for simplicity, just so we know the area of the globe that we're talking about. So to start off with, and it seems sort of kind of a strange place to begin a modern world history class by dealing with the agrarian era. But one of the things I want you to understand here is that those areas that are successful with the evolution to farming, um, they're going to be the ones that will be successful once we get into the textbook. And those places that are successful don't necessarily have any magical thing about them. By and large, and we'll get into this in this book, but also when we touch with guns, germs, and steel, it tends to be more of a geography issue. Those places that are blessed with geography are going to be blessed with opportunities. And the first opportunity is going to be with agriculture. Those areas that are not going to be blessed geographically are going to find it very difficult to take that those steps within the agrarian era to become farmers and then to develop. And again, it's nothing, you know, magically wrong with them that they're not able to attain this. It has a lot to simply do with their geography. So to start off here, is the agrarian era began about 10 to 11,000 years ago with the appearance of the first agricultural communities. The agrarian era, just flat out definition, is, quote, the era of human history when agriculture was the most important of all productive te- productive technologies and the foundation for most human society. This agrarian era is going to be a very long period in human history. It's not a little blip. I mean, in fact, the agrarian era only technically ended during the last 250 years when industrial technologies are going to take over and begin to transform human life ways. This era lasted in excess of of 10,000 years, and 70% of all humanity may have lived during this era. This means 70% of all human beings that ever existed on the face of the earth lived during this 10,000 year period of the agrarian era. And it's also sort of kind of funny to mention, or seems kind of unusual to say, that there's a greater population density. Uh, than the era of foragers or the modern era within this agrarian era. And that tends to be that people will be concentrated heavily in areas where farming is good. So there's more people in relatively smaller areas. Where in the forage area, of course, people are going to spread out and be nomadic because they're going to be hunting and gathering. Another name for foragers is going to be hunters and gatherers. And of course, in the modern era, we have technology that allows us to live at some distance away from where we get our agricultural goods. Limits in communication are going to ensure that some parts of the world remain separate. We really don't have the capacity to interconnect some of these world zones that we'll talk about here in a moment. So, Speaking of the world zones, we actually at this point have four, and we'll mark them on a map here uh, in a couple moments. But the four most important here are, one, the Afro-Eurasian landmass, and I'll show you where that is here in a second. The Americas, which you should have an idea of, the Australia, uh, Australia, rather, and the fourth is the islands of the Pacific. Now, these large regions are going to have no contact with each other before 1500, and 1500, or the beginning of the 16th 
20th century is going to be the point in which the Europeans in particular are going to start to go out and explore and begin the very first steps of globalization. Technically, it's actually going to begin in 1492 when, of course, Columbus goes out and sails the ocean blue. In some of these world zones, there are agrarian civilizations where there's dense networks of political, cultural, and economic exchanges. And again, these parts of these world zones are going to have geographic advantages. There's going to be nothing super duper special about the people that live there. It's simply that they have a geographical advantage that allows them to get uh, farming. And of course, those parts of the world that don't have farming at this point and will only develop it later after these world zones start to come together, there's nothing inherently poor about them or there's nothing inherently challenging about them other than just simply their geography. So I just want to take a moment and identify the four world zones here. I know this is sort of kind of simplistic, but it will help us to kind of be on the same page. So if you want to look in your packet, um, I believe it's going to be about the last page. There should be a map in there. So you want to grab it, pause this until uh, you manage to find that, and then we'll kind of fill it out a little bit. So hopefully by now you've found it. If not, continue to pause and we'll just wait here. So the first world zone, um, it's going to be pretty straightforward, but I'm going to divide it up just a little bit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line across Africa right here, roughly. And then what I'm going to do is I am going to label then across the northern part of Africa right here. I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to label that continent or that world zone as Afro-Eurasia.
So with the origins of agriculture, because farmers interfere with their surroundings more deliberately than foragers, and foragers or hunters and gatherers do interfere with their surroundings, it tends to be um, more of a protective um, they will ensure that a known source of nutrition is not going to be bothered, say, by woodland creatures, that type of stuff. So they will be interfering with their surroundings, but nowhere near as deliberately as the farmers or as the agriculturalists. Because of this interference that the farmers do, agriculture is going to magnify the human impact on the natural environment and also the cultures and life ways of humans themselves. I mean, agriculturists, farmers are going to manipulate plant and animal species so much so that they actually begin to alter their genetic makeup. And this process is more commonly referred to as domestication. Now, one of the major misconceptions here, or, or one of the things that is oftentimes overlooked, and you want to put this next note in all caps, put a couple stars by it, underline it, is that humans did not just domesticate other species. They domesticated themselves. It's going to be a big change for humans to go from hunters and gatherers, you know, foragers, migrating, you know, from one place to another place in search of food, living in small family groups, to now living in these eventually larger collections of people that aren't necessarily related to one another in a permanent village establishment. I mean, there's going to have to be a lot of changes to the human beings to adapt to uh, agriculture and to make it successful. One of the other things that oftentimes is overlooked because there is this whole, well, you know, farming is, you know, the planting and growing of crops. It's the raising of animals that, you know, there's a lot more plants and animals out there because that's what farming is. But in reality here is that agriculture does not automatically increase biological productivity. It often reduces it because if you think about it, Farmers are raising plants, for example, that have characteristics that they find valuable, like a plant tastes good, it grows quickly, it's, uh, it doesn't get diseases easily, it's hardy, it can withstand you know, rainstorms and windstorms and, and, and those types of things. And plants that don't have those characteristics, farmers aren't going to continue to plant. So those plants cease to exist. They're not, they become extinct, or at least they become very, very rare. And similar situation is going to be with some of the animals that they, that they raise. They're going to make sure, like, for example, that sheep, which are going to be one of the first domesticated animals, that they grow quickly. That eventually when we get to um, figuring out secondary products that the sheep that we are raising have really fluffy wool. Um, and we're also going to make sure that other animals, wild animals, uh, are not competing for our animals' resources. So we're going to get rid of them. We're also going to ensure that animals, predators, that find our animals just as tasty as we do, don't exist anymore. So we're going to start to thin out the number of animals in order to protect what we end up having. Eventually here, what does happen is that we are able to produce more food. And with that more food, we're able to support a larger population. So more food, more people. Now, there's going to be a couple other steps to that, but at this point, farming can produce more food that they can support a larger population. So again, more food, more people. Where first farming, the best bet is the corridor between the Nile Valley and Mesopotamia that links Africa to Eurasia. And in the next slide, uh, I have it circled so you know exactly where it is. And I'll kind of explain to you probably the reason why these two areas are going to have the first farming. Well, any explanation where we get into where first farming and why first farming needs to take into account that after over 200,000 years or more, during which all humans that lived were foragers, they were hunters and gatherers, that agricultural lifeways are going to appear within just a few thousand years in parts of the world that have no significant contact with one another. 
I mean, we will have farming going on in the Afro-Eurasian zone, and we'll also have agriculture going on in parts of the Americas. And keep in mind that these world zones, like I said at the very beginning of this, have no contact with one another until after the Age of Discovery begins. Again, after 1492, after 1500. So this really bashes the idea, that's a real old school idea, where it's argued or or was believed rather that agriculture is going to come from one place in the world only and is going to spread from that one place all over the world. Um, what also causes some complications with this idea is, is that we have foragers, we have hunters and gatherers who know about farming. But they make the conscious decision to remain foragers. And they're doing this simply because agriculture early on is not consistently productive. Um, You know, we have farmers that are going to be smaller. They live shorter and harder lives. They're more disease prone. Farming, at least until it becomes efficient, is not going to be a steady source of food. In fact, there's a note uh, further down where you actually have farmers who will continue to hunt and gather almost like as a nutritional safety net. Like a, you know, when the crops aren't what we thought that they would be or they fail, we have to go out and hunt and forage to make sure that our tummies are full. We also have a group here that will become what is referred to as affluent foragers. These groups are going to extract more resources from any given area than do traditional foragers. These guys are sort of kind of like the pro level of hunters and gatherers. Now, eventually here, these hunters and gatherers or these foragers will be pushed into farming. Um, And... There's a couple reasons for this, and one of them very, very clearly is overpopulation, especially with the affluent foragers, because again, these guys are going to be able to have more food, so they're going to be able to support a larger population. But at some point, they max out on the food to people ratio, and in order for them to keep up, they have to either A, intensify what they're doing, Or they have to migrate, go someplace else where they think that there's going to be more food options. At some point, the overpopulation pressures are going to push them to farm more and more and more. Um, Eventually, like I said, once these guys do become agriculturalists, or the first group of people that do become agriculturalists, some early farmers will continue to forage as a safety net. Again, because farming early on isn't that efficient and also isn't that rewarding. Um, The communities that chose to intensify are going to take the skills that they already have. Because, you know, like we kind of talked about earlier, the hunters and gatherers or the foragers, they do kind of manipulate their surroundings a little bit. So these early farmers are going to take those skills that they already have. They're just going to take them to the next level. They're going to intensify them. On top of this, farming just comes at the perfect time. It's almost like a perfect ecological storm that's going on here because the last ice age has ended and we have a lengthy period of global warming that makes intensification possible by increasing the range and productivity of many of these edible crops. So when farming does kick off, we have a global warming situation that allows those crops to have a better chance at thriving and allows farming to become more successful. So the area that we have first farming, uh, I just want to show it to you where it is on your map. So if you want to pull that back out and maybe get another color like pen or pencil or something like that. Uh, If you need to dig it out again, just, just press pause, grab it, and then, you know, unpause. But the area that we're looking at, and it's kind of a big area, and we're going to circle right in through there, just, you know, give or take a little bit. 
is both of these areas and the northernmost area, the one up here, is going to eventually be known as Mesopotamia. And the area of first farming within this region is probably going to be in this area right between here, in between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. The other area where there's the contemplation where farming happens, uh, either at the same time or immediately following, is going to be in this particular area here within the Nile River Valley. Now, both of these areas have similar climates, um, and they also are near three major rivers. And the three major rivers here of the Nile, and then like I said earlier, the Tigris and Euphrates, they both have a, or had, a unique characteristic of the fact that on a yearly basis they would flood. And in the wake of those floods, the river would deposit very, very fertile silt. So in both of these areas, you have amazingly fertile soil. You also are not very away from a source of water, so it's easy to hydrate your plants. And these are the two areas where it is most likely that agriculture is going to occur first. These arguments in the text are going to appear to explain the curious near simultaneous nature of the transition to agriculture at the end of the last ice age. After agriculture appears in any one region, it's going to spread primarily because of the population of farming communities is going to grow so fast that they have to find new land to farm. So, like I told you before, if we have more food, we have more people. If we have more people, the next step to this or the next part of this is more problems. And one of these more problems is we have to continue to figure out how to feed these more people. And the only way to do that is by continuing to farm and more specifically to expand where it is that we are farming. So as agriculture continues to be successful, and one of the other things that you know we'll reference here a little bit later is, is that successes will spread where failures will die. Because farming is successful, it has to continue to spread in order to continue to be successful because we have to feed these more people. And where it spreads is going to be very specific. And we'll get into this in the next slide. But just kind of know it's going to spread to neighboring like areas to start off with. Although agriculture, and it's understandable why it's an unattractive option to many foragers, because again, farming isn't that efficient day one. Farmers have shorter, rougher lives, epidemic level diseases that we'll talk about later on. And like I said earlier, some foragers or some hunters and gatherers will make the conscious decision not to become for farmers. But farming communities, regardless of this, usually had more resources and more people than these foraging communities. Again, there's some reasons behind this. The big one is because farming is like a team sport. Like everybody needs to be participating in farming and large numbers of people need to be participating in farming for quite some time here in history in order for these communities to be successful. Eventually here, agriculture, because of its success, spread most quickly in regions that bordered established agricultural zones. Again, these are neighboring areas that have similar soils, similar climates, and similar ecologies. Even in areas that are in different parts of the world, in different world zones, you can almost draw a band across the globe as to where these agricultural communities are going to be settled because areas of similar geography tend to have other similarities as well, like length of day, climate, and other important things to agriculture. But, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit later.